Okay, in this tutorial we're going to have a look at how to use the SPSS bootstrap facility. Uh, many of the tests that um, I talk about in my textbook um, rely on certain assumptions to be accurate. And one of the big assumptions that crops up time and time again is uh, to do with the distribution of uh, residuals or assumptions about the distribution of the population. And often you'll find when you actually collect some data uh, they tend to have a nasty habit of not uh, conforming to that assumption. So uh, in one of the chapters of the book, I think it's chapter 5, but it's quite a long time ago since I wrote it, so who knows, might be a different chapter. Um, I spend quite a lot of time telling you how to transform your data, which can sometimes help, but uh, anyone who's actually tried transforming their data uh, will realise that 9 times out of 10 it doesn't do any good at all. and uh, basically you just waste your time doing it um, so the kind of million dollar question then is um, what can you do then if you transform your data and that doesn't work and uh, you know you're, you're kind of stuck needing to analyze the data that you've got is there anything that you can do well the answer is yes you can do something called bootstrapping which um, I talk about in a really small amount of detail in the book because at the time that I wrote the book, SPSS couldn't do bootstrapping, so I thought, wow, no point in writing too much about that, because people will just get depressed about the fact that they can't do it on SPSS. So I'll be responsible for everyone being, you know, suicidal, and you know, in this age of litigation, who knows what might happen. So I kind of just skipped over it, uh, and then SPSS, in their infinite wisdom, uh, about a nanosecond after the book was published, decided uh, that they'd put a bootstrap facility in. Uh, which is actually really good news for everyone because uh, now when you've got nasty, horrible, ugly looking data uh, it's really easy to do some robust tests on it so happy days but bad news for uh, me because uh, it means that <laughs> basically about five chapters worth of um, stuff where I say oh you can't do this on SPSS turns out now that I'm completely lying because you can still, never mind uh, I think on balance the, the uh, you know the benefits to the world outweigh the cost to me so we're gonna have a look at this bootstrap thing um, and one, on the plus side um, the other way to do some of the robust tests would have been to use a, a program called R which you can integrate with SPSS using a, a plugin that SPSS have developed but frankly it's a bit of a pain in the ass and um, using the bootstrap facility is uh, about a billion times easier so there, it's, you know, happy days all round. Now, what I need to tell you about the Bootstrap uh, facility, first of all, is that it doesn't come as standard. SPSS, I believe, uh, charge you extra money for it. So it's a separate module. So if you're hunting around your menus and you can't see the little Bootstrap button, um, that's basically because you haven't paid for the module. Um, so off you go pay for it and it will magically appear or better still get your university or company or uh, Father Christmas to pay for it instead um, so basically what I'm going to do is there's various chapters in the book where I've said uh, there are what are known as robust tests so these are, are tests that are basically accurate when the uh, traditional assumptions are violated and as I said bootstrapping is one way around this problem and basically what bootstrapping does is to kind of em empirically derive um, the distribution of the test statistic or the standard error or some other important thing that you're using in your analysis so it takes your actual data it takes uh, a sample from it and then it takes another sample and then another sample and in fact you can set how many samples it takes it takes lots and lots and lots of samples it calculates or estimates the population parameter that you're interested in in each of those samples and from that derives uh, a sampling distribution so for example if you imagine uh, you know you've you've got a you're trying to estimate a mean or something or a standard error basically you sample from your data calcu calculate a mean you put all the scores back resample calculate a mean put all the scores back resample calculate a mean and so on and so forth and from all of those like thousand means that you've got uh, you can you basically have a sampling distribution so it's a it's a way around needing to assume uh, normal distributions or normal errors because you you basically uh, empirically derive your distribution from the data that you have 
Uh, that was a pretty rubbish explanation, actually. I'd probably explain it better in the book. Uh, I'm not very good thinking off the cuff. Anyway, uh, so regression. So in the textbook, uh, we have an example of a record company looking at sales of records based on how much they've spent on advertising. That's this variable here. Uh, how much airplay they've uh, had on radio and the attractiveness of the band. So our outcome is sales and we've got three predictors, advertising budget, airplay and attractiveness of the band. Now if you go to the analyze menu and to regression and linear regression, uh, you get a dialog box like this. If you've uh, read the book you'll be familiar with this dialog box. The thing to know, if you have a look at the, uh, the image in the book chapter, you'll note that it doesn't have this button at the bottom that says bootstrap. Uh, that's because at the time I wrote the book the bootstrap facility didn't exist as I mentioned earlier on. So this is basically the extra gadget that I'm trying to explain. So in the book, um, as I said, we're trying to predict record sales. So that's our outcome variable. And we were trying to predict it from advertising budget and also um, airplay and attractiveness of the band. Now I'm just going to force all of these variables in um, in one go. I'm not going to kind of follow the example literally from the book um, because, well, you can read the book. So we're just going to leave all the uh, standard default options as they are. So we want estimates of regression coefficients. Uh, I'm going to ask for confidence interval because they're always nice. And apart from that, I'm just going to leave it as it is. Now, if you click on the bootstrap button, you get this new dialog box up, and you can see if you if you select it, it will do a bootstrap. You can uh, change the number of samples that you have. A thousand is the default. You can you know, add more and more samples, and um, well, there are various reasons why you might want to do that, but the defaults are probably fine for most purposes. Um, you can calculate confidence intervals based on a bootstrap, and you can change the level of confidence interval again. 95% confidence intervals are kind of the norm, at least they are in uh, psychology where I work. Um, and you can choose between percentile confidence intervals or bias corrected ones. And personally, I would go for the bias corrected ones. Um, and then in terms of how you how the bootstrap performs the sampling, you can use simple sampling, which is what I would do. Uh, you know, other things being equal, but in some cases you might want to use stratified sampling if um, <clears throat> you know if you've got particular grouping variables and it makes sense to sample on that basis. So click on continue and then OK, and your output is going to look like this. Now it's going to take a bit of a while to generate because it's uh, well it's computing lots and lots of samples and doing stuff but you can see down here it is running the regression but uh, it's just taking a bit of a while to do it. So at this point it's a good opportunity to go and make a cup of tea or uh, you know stick your head in an oven or something. Okay so we've got our output from our regression it looks pretty similar to uh, what you'll be familiar with if you've read the book chapter. So we've got a basic summary of our model, tells us our R and R square, things like that. We've got an ANOVA that tells us the overall fit of the model, which is significant, which means including the three predictors that we have um, made the model a significantly better fit than um, using the overall mean of record sales as a prediction. And down here, uh, we've got our regression coefficients and so on and so forth. That's you know all uh, all as it would be before. Now the difference is we've got an extra table down here, which you can see is uh, bootstrap coefficients. So the betas up here are generated without a bootstrap, and they have standard errors that are not bootstrapped. Whereas down here we have bootstrapped standard errors. So the beta coefficients don't change, but the standard errors do because they've been bootstrapped and it gives you an estimate of the bias 
and based on that new standard error you get a new significance value as well and a new confidence interval around the beta value. So the things that have changed essentially are the standard errors are different, they've been bootstrapped and the confidence intervals of the beta coefficients are different and the significance values potentially as well. Now in, in terms of in interpretation nothing much changed actually first thing to note for advertising budget there's very little bias indeed and that's basically zero and you can see the bootstrap standard error is more or less the same as the original one uh, for the radio play there's a bit of a change in the standard errors as a result of bootstrapping and there's a bit of a change also with attractiveness of the band nothing major has happened really now in terms of reporting and interpretation um, you would just report these betas down here and the bootstrap standard errors and obviously tell people that those standard errors are bootstrapped and if you're reporting the confidence intervals it will be these ones that you'd report. So it's all pretty straightforward. The big difference is um, these standard errors and the confidence intervals around the betas are robust. So in other words um, if you were if you had cause for concern about the uh, normality of the errors or the residuals in the regression model you can kind of trust these values more than you can trust the values up here. Okay, so how does it work in ANOVA? We've got a new example here, which is taken from uh, chapter 12, which was uh, to do the beer goggles effect. And if you remember, we tested females and males. Uh, we gave them different doses of alcohol, so none, two pints or four pints. And then we uh, basically asked them to find themselves a date and then we got some judges to rate the attractiveness of the dates. Now the idea was that the more you drink the uh, the less choosy you become about your dates. If you want to run the analysis we go to the GLM menu it's a univariate ANOVA so we click on univariate our outcome was attractiveness of the date and we had two fixed factors alcohol consumption and gender now, in the options, I'm going to ask for some means of all of our effects and also uh, to compare the main effects with Bonfrani corrected tests and ask for some descriptive statistics and some homogeneity tests. Now, if we want to do bootstrap, sorry, I probably did that too quickly, we click on bootstrap it's the same uh, dialog box as we had for regression you can pretty much leave everything as it is except uh, I normally like to use bias corrected confidence intervals now what we should find is by selecting the bootstrap we get bootstrapped confidence intervals for our post hoc tests which would give us a robust way of seeing which groups differ from which at least that's the theory we'll see if it actually happens uh, as with the regression, it's taking a bit of time to do it. But here we go. So first of all, we get a table of descriptive statistics. So we've got our alcohol conditions, none, two pints and four pints. And uh, within those groups, males and females, and we've got the mean attractiveness um, in each of those conditions. And you can see we get a mean. And then because we've asked for bootstrap, we get an estimate of the bias we get a bootstrap standard error and we get a robust confidence interval for that mean. So that's where the, basically where the, the bootstrap came into effect. Uh, all of this is, uh, sorry, the Levine's test and the F tests are actually the same as before. No bootstrapping has happened there, unfortunately. Uh, but what we do get is for the estimated marginal means that we asked for, again, we get these uh, bootstrap confidence intervals and uh, we can use these confidence intervals and whether they overlap or not to give us some idea about how the groups differ but we also get some pairwise comparisons so we asked for example uh, on the effect of gender sorry not on the effect of gender on the effect of alcohol to uh, do some pairwise comparisons and here they are but down below we've got bootstrapped versions of those so in other words we've got a bootstrap standard error for the difference between groups um, and a confidence interval as well so this will tell us again in a robust way whether these groups are different so 
the no pints and two pints group were not significantly different and that robust confidence interval crosses zero whereas uh, for none and four pints the confidence interval doesn't cross zero and therefore you know it's significant but the important thing is we know that that confidence interval is robust to um, distribution issues that we might have um, likewise for the effective gender we get bootstrapped pairwise comparisons now so um, we can see whether there's a difference between males and females and again with this robust uh, confidence interval we can see that there was no significant difference also on the interaction term by again inspecting these robust confidence intervals we can get some idea of which groups differ from which by looking at whether the uh, confidence intervals overlap knowing that these confidence intervals are again robust right so let's have a look at a t-test then so uh, if you want to do a t-test again uh, well the example from chapter 9 of the book was whether uh, people who are scared of spiders show more anxiety to a picture of a spider or a real spider so we've got a grouping variable here whether it's a picture or a real spider and we've got their levels of anxiety so we go to the analyze menu and compare means we want to do an independent samples t-test and our outcome is anxiety and oops type of pic picture was our grouping variable our groups were defined by 0 and 1 and yeah, that's all fine again we've got this bootstrap option now same as the regression you can ask for a bootstrap I'm going to ask for a bias corrected uh, confidence interval OK, and it'll take a bit of time. Go SPSS, give me a bootstrap. Right, so what we have now is we've got means for our two groups. So mean anxiety in the picture group was 40, mean anxiety in the spider group, real spider group was 47. Uh, but we've got bootstrap standard errors and bootstrap confidence intervals and also for the actual t-test itself um, we can see that the standard error is uh, bootstrapped as well and the confidence interval for the mean difference is um, bootstrapped also so uh, we can compare these confidence intervals here with these bootstrap confidence intervals there there's actually not a lot of difference in this case um, but again the big difference is we know that this confidence interval is relatively robust uh, to violations of or distributional violations so happy days we can trust this one uh, well to be fair we can probably trust that one as well but uh, other things being equal if we knew nothing about our um, distributions and our errors and things like that then we can trust this one Hooray! okay that's it for bootstrapping um, yeah so enjoy enjoy the bootstrapping module <laughs>